Last Pine Productions presents the New Way Podcast with Ben and Matt. The New Way Podcast contains adult content, including everyone. Everyone? Everyone! Listener discretion is advised. When you marooned me on that godforsaken spit of land, you forgot one very important thing, mate. I'm Captain Jack Sparrow. What is it that you really like to do? Eat. Uh, Debbie can't talk right now. My dick's in her mouth. How about if I ever call you back when I'm done? Four stones, four crates, zero stones, zero crates! Everybody wants to be naked and famous. Everybody wants to be just like me and naked. Will you help teach me about this? What is it? A new way? Welcome once again to the New Way Podcast with Ben and Matt. You scared me again. <laughs> Welcome! <laughs> Shit! Um, I'm, I'm Matt. I'm frightened. I'm Ben. Um, <laughs> anyways, thanks again for uh, tuning in this week. And uh, of course you can find us on our website, lastpintprod.com. We've got social media click-throughs there, so you can pretty much find us anywhere. Uh, Click-throughs, I like that. Very technical yes, uh, very, terminology. Very technical terminology. But uh, yeah, you can also find us on facebook.com slash lastpintprod. Or no, last pint. Last so pint. I always every mix it up. time, Ben. Last every pint. Every time. And it's at last pint prod on Twitter, which we need to start building up and start utilizing some. Yeah, we do have two followers on Twitter, Ben and myself, uh, are following last pint. I'm going to be tweeting. <laughs> it's like the up. biggest Twitter circle <laughs> jerk of all time. <laughs> I was so excited because it's like you have a new Twitter follower, and I was like, ah, oh, it's Ben. <laughs> um, yeah, we will we will be uh, tweeting a little bit more and uh, kind of giving you a heads up with the podcast, like we do on Facebook. So, um, you know, go ahead and, and if, follow us on Twitter. What's it matter? You're following 7,000 people anyway. You might as well follow us and get an update once every month. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, anyways, well, we're going to uh, kind of talk about an interesting sort of topic today. And uh, I'm not sure if this is going to be – I'm assuming maybe this one's going to run after the one that we do with uh, – with our next guest, but we're, we're, we're going to keep people guessing. We're going to keep people uh, guessing, anyways. You, we'll, you we'll may see. be listening to this somewhere in the future, so future people, if the world has become a post-apocalyptic, the, you know, the road or postman esque, uh, we apologize for being so I, flippant I, about I, uh, the current events going on. Let me just here. say that I have to come clean about one thing: if the apocalypse does happen between now and the time that this podcast is airing, I would like to say. Then when I was eight years old, I stole a Kit Kat bar from Hairbenders, my mom's uh, <laughs> beauty salon in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And the owner, Vula, I'm really, really sorry because I know that that's been troubling you, where that Kit Kat bar has gone. Vula sounds like a witch. Like, you stole a candy bar I, from a I, witch. I, I, you were going to get cursed. I, I think I've been cursed in my entire life. <laughs> well, that's why you have twin girls. It's all, it's all coming it was, back around. It was all because of the Kit Kat. <laughs> I mean, I was just, imagine I was just like this kid. I was like hungry. I was like, oh, man, that Kit Kat bar looks good. I didn't have 50 cents that they put into the little thing, but they were just laying out. You know where it's, you know, those things where it's like, grab it if you want to and put the 50 cents in the thing. Uh, It wasn't an actual, it was a place that was too cheap to have an actual vending machine. The moral of the story is never allow Ben one of these, uh, like, on your honor systems because he will take advantage of it and he will steal you. I I take your candy bar. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Anyways, today we're going to talk about kind of a fun subject, uh, which is uh, character actors and kind of going through, which is Matt's idea, brilliant, came up with last night. I actually thought that was a very, very good uh, topic, and uh, and it is kind of interesting thing because I think we probably have very different, um, or at least maybe not exactly the same definitions for what a character actor is or what a character actor does. So um, so it could make for an interesting discussion. Before I get into that... I was just going to say I was waiting for the podcast. I realized this morning on the way over here that Matt pretty much just asked me to do the most nonsensical thing he's ever asked me to do, <laughs> which is, okay, so, so here's the thing. The, the, first off, it's a completely normal request, which is on your way over to my place to do the podcast, can you stop, at, well, there's a Starbucks on the way, can you stop and get me a grande, no fat, uh, like skim latte, which is a completely normal Skinny. request. <laughs> a skinny latte. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, that, that that makes perfect sense. Here's the, the the caveat, though, is that I'm running because it's like a perfect 1.6 miles from my house to Matt's house. So it's a good, it's a nice way to get some exercise or whatever. So I figure, oh, I usually run over here. 
So first off, I'm thinking, well, yeah, that's not that big of a, that's not that much of a problem. But first off, it's like 10 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. On Mother's Day. On Mother's Day. I thought about that after the fact. (laughs) And A, and B, the Starbucks is literally .48 miles from Matt's house. So I run to the Starbucks, am sweating, like profusely, sweat pouring down, and I'm in a long line with these people giving me dirty looks. I buy, I I have to wait in line for 10 minutes, (laughs) I get the thing, and then I realize I'm still half a mile, and Matt is like, oh, by the way, I'm going to see a movie later, so you have to hurry (laughs) over here, we have to do the podcast really quickly. So I run the last half mile, (laughs) which is where you got your extra love in there. Oh, it's from you were sweating. No, that that thing was shaken, not stirred, Mm. because I ran over here, and I was like, ugh. And and so here I am running down a base Boynton Beach Boulevard, which is a four-lane road, Run, trying to run in a pretty fast clip, but also trying to keep a grande, non-fat latte it's steady. It's part of your training. It's like Dagobah. I got so many weird looks from drivers <laughs> coming by, were just looking at me like, look at this poor, sad bastard. They, they must have thought like you really liked hot coffee and you're trying to get it home in time. Like, I'm going to get the coffee back while it's I'm hot. Like, I'm like, obviously, I've got earbuds in. I'm like, obviously, exercising. What I'm thinking, they're probably thinking is like, this little... That asshole is trying to exercise, but he's so he's so ridiculous. He can't go without a Starbucks. He's like running. Well, this guy doesn't know how to exercise. Should have just like thrown it in your face, like ah, feel the burn. It was it was awful. <laughs> Anyways, oh, I just thought it was really funny because I was walking here. I was like that, and it, it was funny because it didn't dawn on me until like as I was like running down the street and getting weird looks. I was like, this is a pretty dumb thing. I kind of thought about that, and I, you could have just this driven was, out. <laughs> no, I absolutely. I, I could have walked there myself. It's very close to my place. I kind of was just. Just feeling like I was kind of testing Ben this morning because Ben Ben is classic for like I'll be coming home from work to do the podcast and like the the timing's always perfect. Ben's like, oh, "Hey man, can you pick up a six pack?" Yeah, yeah stop, and, stop and get some stop beer. And, stop and get some beer on the way there, and like stop and get this. And so I was like, "I'm gonna do that to Ben this morning while he's running with hot coffee down Boynton Beach Boulevard." Like. I, I was just sitting on my porch and like laughing to myself like a Bond villain. Uh, uh, it's like, <laughs> I also told him to tell them to put extra love in it, and they they didn't put enough love in it. Well, uh, anyways, but it's okay. But it, I just thought that was funny though because but, I, I. But it was also funny that it didn't dawn on me how dumb it was until I was actually doing it. I was like, "Wow, this was a really stupid idea." I should have been like, "Why are you? Why don't you just go there yourself?" <laughs> and I love that I told Ben. I was like, hey, can you pick me up a skinny uh, grande latte from Starbucks on your way over here? Uh, and I was like, um, just let me know when when, when you leave uh, so I have time to put on pants. And he's like, I don't know if you're joking about either of these things. And I'm like, I'm not about either of these well, things. Well, so, I mean, I, I, I don't know. You could have just been like, oh, yes, by the way, while you're running, can you stop and get me a non-fat latte? And I was like, wait, I mean... Is he serious? You, oh, okay. Well, you, that's you fine. You passed the test and that I can now request more things. Yes, exactly. I'll push it each time. Anyways, well, <laughs> to get back on track and actually talk about you know character actors, I think the first thing uh, that we should, I guess, discuss is what really classifies a character actor and, the, and also just sort of the... Uh, obviously, we there are a bunch of people that I think would qualify uh, in some by some criteria as a character actor or not since the birth of cinema, basically since the very early days. But what, like, what do you think, what do you consider a character actor? Like, how would you define that? Well, I mean, it's kind of gone through a lot of iterations, especially now that there are more movies and specifically TV. TV has become this gigantic playground for character actors. And it makes sense because a TV show really is about character. It's, you know, Plot is less important over the length of a series than it is about good characterizations and good, good characters that can fill those, those ancillary roles. Um, it used to just be the character actor was the fat, funny comic relief. It was, you know, like Buddy Hackett and, and Edward G. Robinson and Peter Laurie wasn't really fat, but like, it used to be like the comic sidekick. Those were usually populated by the same character actors in the studio films through the 40s and 50s of just the same people would show up in the same exact role. And that carried over, I think, into the 80s and 90s. And then there was just sort of a shift of you could be a character actor and be pretty. Like, I mean, somebody, and not to get too over in specifics, this may be on your list. This was someone I kind of had on the outside of my list. But somebody like Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp has, I imagine, it's maybe someone you put on your list. Right. Um, you know, that's not what used to be considered a character guy. Well, here's, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that you're, you kind of hit the nose there because I think that there was a, a some period in time where 
there was this birth where these character actors, you're exactly right, like in the in the 40s and 50s, were these guys that, that kind of showed up in these ancillary roles and were known for, you know, not even necessarily being comic relief, but, but for being the second guy or for being yeah. the buddy or for being one of those other guys. But I think it was really around in the 50s and 60s, sort of around the the where the um, the movement really began began with method, mm-hmm. and where method became a lot bigger of a deal, uh, where these character actors started, I think, being classified more character actors because of their i their ability to play characters differently from mm-hmm. one another where there, you could look at one character and that, w- that would be completely different from another character but they're still ancillary characters they're, yes, they're, these, yes. they're these people that they show up they weren't stock right exactly they, they weren't they weren't playing themselves essentially like you have your complete antithesis of what we would consider a character actor and somebody like a you know Kevin Costner mm-hmm. um, so uh, although funny enough Silverado was on, was on this morning and I was watching it <laughs> and, and you know that was the movie that really kind of got Kevin Costner discovered, and that's probably his most, if you had to say a character role for any sort of leading man that doesn't have a whole lot of major range as far as the, I mean, they might have a lot of emotional range, yeah, yeah, but they yeah. don't have a lot of character range. He actually is very, very much a different character in that movie than you would usually, you know, pin on a Kevin Costner Not thing. the typical Costner fan. Right, exactly. But I mean, that was also his first film, so, or his first major film. Yeah. So that, that's kind of interesting. But yeah, there are all of those actors out there that obviously are... Uh, and it, you, I mean, Robert Redford's like a perfect one to yeah. uh, to say uh, uh, that, that you can never, ever possibly consider a character actor. They're leading men who are essentially... They're good actors. Tom Cruise. I think Tom yes. Cruise is a great actor. But they're Even always, though he can play... Like, he can play. That's the thing. And that's, but, like, but, he's, that's what makes him such a versatile actor, actually. But there's actually. something... There's some delineation that needs to be made. That it, obviously, we don't think that Tom yeah, Cruise yeah. is a character actor. Even though he can play lots of different characters, there's still something about him that he's Tom Cruise acting well, yes, basically. Yes. I mean, or uh, acting not so well. Same as Tom ways. Hanks. Not Even though he, yes. he could have, back in the day, gone the character actor route, he's no, not. It's no, just no, Tom absol- Hanks. Absolutely not. And, yeah, and so... But, anyways, I, that's the thing I was kind of interested in, is when when a lot of these things... And I, I bring it back to, like, sort of a Brando type of role, mm-hmm. where Brando was sort of that first, I think, mainstream sort of... Uh, method character actor because I mean he was method he was very old school but even though a lot of times even though in his he was playing some lead roles and some supporting roles he always seemed to be he was very 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 different in his yeah. in his delivery and his cadence and his mannerisms and, and everything and he, obviously you know Brando was known as a universal prick but I feel like it was, you know, from an actress standpoint, around the same time in the '60s, Gina Rollins, who was doing all of this very, very, and into the '70s, doing yeah. this very, very subversive work, a, a lot of times as that third character, yeah. whereas the second character is not the main character in the in the movie, um, was doing these extremely different characters and these com- completely different iterations of nothing remotely similar to herself. Yeah, and I think because I, I consider Gina Rollins like the birth of the female character actress, you know? Um, and that's funny, like, I, I I was pressing myself to try and fill my list with females as well, and I was having a lot, I, because I, I my list isn't just, like, these are character actors, it's like, these are character actors I like. There are bad character actors, oh, sure. and a lot of times, unfortunately, like, with the, the chick flicks we talked about, there's, there's almost always the, like, homely best friend, the Rhoda to the Mary, there, there's always this secondary female that's usually not as attractive as the lead and it's always this stock character and it's filled with character actresses and they're not bad but it's just it's lazy writing it's kind of lazy acting and there's only a few I think that break out on the actor side and I'm really like I could watch this person in any movie for it yeah absolutely but anyways so here's one thing I kind of wanted to ask you as we're talking about some of the the greats or some of those that really like I said I want before we get into naming some of the character actors as we would I guess define them today Mm -hmm. I think that there are these there's you have this group of people sort of from not necessarily the literal new wave but as soon as the art film craze started especially in the 60s where a lot of actors, mainstream actors, became what I would consider character actors. Until the mid-1980s, I would consider Dustin Hoffman a character actor. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I would also, until the mid-80s, or in late 80s, would have considered Robert De Niro a character actor, to some extent. De Niro yeah, became... That. Yeah, yeah. Around Goodfellas, De Niro became De Niro. Yeah. And he's been De Niro since then. Before that, you could watch his roles. I mean, there are a few outliers. Yeah. But before that, he was very different in his, in his del- cadence, his delivery. I mean, and... Those are great actors. Those, are, those yeah. are legitimate leading men, you know, who are at the top of their craft. I wouldn't go as far as, say, Pacino. Pacino was a, was a fantastic actor, but Pacino was, I think, more along the lines of the other leading man, where he was always playing some sort of version yeah. of... and he was also... And it's and it's very difficult, and we'll, we'll talk about that. It's also very difficult for someone that's a sex symbol on the male side sure. to make it a, a, as a character actor, which is why, you know, and I, I think Ben will probably go into Johnny Depp a little bit more, but that's when I keep coming back to you that, you know, Depp is a sex symbol. Depp was a model turned actor who who became a character actor. A rock star yeah, turned a, model ex- turned. Exactly. And that's like, he's he's got to be almost the exception that proves the rule because that usually, that's the difference, I think, between De Niro and... And Pacino, Pacino was more of a sex symbol, I think, than De Niro ever was. And Pacino was doing, you know, Sea of Love and that kind of stuff, and was kind of this, like, almost that that swashbuckling isn't the right word. No, but you know I understand what, I mean. what you're yeah. saying, yeah. He definitely had a lot more of that sort of old-school Hollywood type of leading man yep. uh, capability. Whereas, that's what I'm saying, a lot of the, with Hoffman and, and De Niro, we're talking about a lot more off-kilter, a lot more off-beat. They, yeah. they made some interesting choices with performances, and in some cases just made complete departures with their performances, where they were doing something just ridiculously different from what, it, what they, in the same way that, you know, Depp would approach a role or something, where it's going to be different from anything that they've done before. Well, yeah, and we, and we should we should make a split right now of, of, like, of one actor that popped into my head that I think is, like, he's a different type of character actor and that he's an actor that plays one character well, which is Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford is literally a, just the Han Solo character actor. <laughs> like, like he, he's... I, 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 no, I, I honestly don't consider Harrison Ford a character actor. He's I not, think, no, no, I mean, I'm saying he's not a character actor, it's a play on the, the words of, like, he's just a character. Oh, right, <laughs> and, there you and go. Then, yes. And the only one character actor. What, a one character actor. Yeah, one trick I, pony. Yeah, a, absolutely, I, I can understand that. And in the same way, some, some other guys, too, like, you know, Kurt Russell, or, uh, is also sort of, I mean, even though he has some more range, I yeah. feel like, than, than Ford does, Kurt Russell has that sort of, offbeat boyish charm and and uh this uh this intensity i guess about the way that he you know and, and he's got swagger and his swag yeah the swag's yeah. a perfect you know, swagger and swag's a perfect word but uh even though he's sort of a leading man he's kind of one of those one trick where he can he can surf on a roll yeah with that type of of uh of ability basically that t- type of uh uh magnetism uh, magnetism. Anyways, well, so we can kind of start going through just some of the actors, and I think some of this might lead off into other discussion because, it, like I said, uh, my my current view of what a character actor is is somebody who is mostly an, a secondary player or yes. has been for a lot of their career, mm-hmm. and I've got some that are I'll get to later that aren't that yes. I consider character actors, even though they're leading men. So we'll go through like the really stock kind of ones. Yes, but, but I consider them. I consider a character actor somebody who is who is acted in uh, in pieces with lots of moving parts, but also that have a very definitive ability to switch between one type of character and the other. I, like here's I'll, I'll do one yeah, that might be on your your list here. I don't think that Philip Seymour Hoffman's a character actor. He's my ultimate character See, actor. I don't think he's a character actor at all. I think he 100% uh, uh, is. Uh, 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 the, the I was going to give is, him the honor, like, the, the medal of Mr. Character Actor I knew, of and the year. I, I knew you were going to do that. And here's the reason why I feel like... I love Philip Seymour Hoffman. Um, I love a lot of his roles. He loves you. He, I, he's done very definitive characters... Uh, that, that are different from him, his own himself, with things like uh, Boogie Nights, with Capote, with Flawless, especially. Mm-hmm. Um, however, there's something about Hoffman where Hoffman never. Hoffman is always he disappears into his role, but he's still Hoffman to me. I'm always no. I'm always. I'm always 
know that I'm watching. But I him. still. But that's why I and, think like he's the he's old Hollywood character exactly. character and, actor. And, and that, that's maybe why because I think maybe my character actor uh, definition has changed. They're from, chameleons. From, from, yours are, I, and I think that will be the interesting thing that's a difference between our list is that I think you're going for people that uh, who chameleons. completely yes. disappear. Chameleons a, a perfect word uh, that can completely disappear in their role. Whereas I think you are thinking sort of along just the basic lines. I have like a, yeah, I have like a like I'll, I'll throw one out here from from your favorite movie as well, which is William Atherton, who plays who is the a- asshole in every '80s movie that was made, from Real Genius to Ghostbusters to um, Die Hard. Die Hard. Um, Atherton was like a a great stock character actor that was he you in like as soon as you saw him. You're just like, oh, I fucking hate this guy. And what I love is I read this great interview with him where he was talking about, like, he did some movie in the late 90s for, I think it was, like, maybe a straight to Showtime or, or, like, a cable movie. And he was playing, like, a like a romantic lead. And he's like, it's going to fail. Like, he just, he, he resigned himself. He's like, I, I just, I was too iconic for what I did in the 80s that I can't, you can't see me, I can't disappear. But I still think it's a great character actor and that he's, he is very good at that well, one thing. It's funny, I have some that are along those lines. Yeah. Here's, here's one that's kind of tit for tat for that, albeit a little bit more modern. Christopher McDonald. Christopher McDonald is a very well-known character actor, and he's also, I think, played the asshole or bad guy more than he's typically played the good guy, it yeah. seems like. And it's, it's, he also plays, like, the buffoon a lot. Like, he's a foil. He's almost always a foil of one kind or another. Well, I mean, you know, he's Shooter McGavin, yeah. you know? I mean, it's, you know... Uh, that, he eats pieces of shit for breakfast. Yeah, exactly. But, but you know, Christopher McDonald isn't one of those chameleons, necessarily. But he has... He shows up in a lot of work. And he has... Uh, his characters always do have some sort of differentiating, you know, uh, things along those lines. I, I just consider him um, a, sort of along the lines of somebody else who I feel like is kind of up there along those lines but maybe a little bit more to the chameleon side of things is Stanley Tucci oh yeah Tucci's great Tucci is a is a fantastic actor and is almost like when was the last time Stanley Tucci was the starring role in a movie <laughs> never <laughs> he's Big never. Night the only movie I think that he's but, ever been but, like the the, the lead, which he wrote he had to write like he was like I want a leading role so I'm gonna write one <laughs> right. well I, I understand because it's like Stanley Tucci you'll you'll they'll give him you a leading role on Broadway they'll yeah. give you a leading role in a play you you're not gonna anchor a, a Hollywood movie with a lot of money behind it just because I don't feel like he has that he doesn't have the drawing power obviously that people thought no and that's had. a really when you bring up a really good point almost Every single person that we'll talk about in this list, not all, but I'd say like 90%, almost all of them are theater actors. And I think most good character actors, not all, but most, come from a theater background because they they know how to work. I think the biggest, the most important thing for a character actor is to know how to fit into an ensemble. A character actor has to know exactly what their role, not just like their character role, but their role in the story, in the plot, in the mix of the movie. They have to know that percentage, that magic number that makes it that they're not going to overshadow anything that's going on. They're going to support everything. Um, which is, and I'm kind of curious to get your take on this. I I tried to keep my list mostly bare of, uh, of villains, as far as big villains. Like, comic book villains... And uh, James Bond villains are almost always character actors, but they're so... Like, I had ha- uh, Javier Bardem on my list sure. as a character actor. I think that... I think he And he up. is, and it's just... But there's so many because... And he's one that works because he also has several other ones that I think build into that character act role. But I wouldn't necessarily put Heath Ledger on my list because I think Ledger has one iconic character actor role... And I think his other work, while it is multi-varied, is leading man. And it's mostly leading man yeah. stuff. Yeah, so, I, I agree with that. By the way, I, I'm sorry, I just got a very important, 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 important text. text hey, <laughs> ah, I got hey enough. boss, what kind of text you get? <laughs> I got an important text. It's uh, apparently I've been added to one of those things. Where, uh, it says, Giorgio's Pizza celebrates mom. Oh, today's Mother's Day, by the way. <laughs> Mother's Day till Father's Day. Get any large pizza, six pepperoni rolls, family size salad, and two liter soda for 19.99. We are now sponsored by Giorgio's Pizza. There we go. Give mom the gift of diabetes this Mother's Day. (laughs) Jesus Christ, that was a huge fucking meal. For for 20 bucks, too. Six pepperoni rolls. (laughs) Uh, The funny thing is, my 
My <laughs> wife, since she's been pregnant, all of a sudden started eating pork again. Like, she just can't get enough bacon. I bet you she would eat some pepperoni. <laughs> oh, she ate, like, two slices of pepperoni pizza the last time we got pizza. I was like, she hadn't eaten They know pepperoni. you, man. Social oh. media marketing. Well yeah. done, Giorgio's. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think I know what I'm eating for dinner tonight. Yes, <laughs> I like that we have a new sponsor, because previously the New Way podcast has been sponsored by beer. Uh, mainly just beer. It's what's in us. So uh, that, I like that we've switched over. Uh, I just thought that was very important to point out. Oh, I want, um, I want to put a, I want to give a special uh, character actor shout out, by the way, here, because we talked about William Atherton, but I think there was, and he's unfortunately, actually, and there's, a, there's two, there are two uh, no longer with us character actors that I was always a huge fan of in just about everything around, and they're completely polar opposites as far as the kind of characters they play. One is J.T. Walsh, and I'm not sure if you know exactly yes, who J.T. Walsh is. J.T. Walsh, any of you out there, I, I would say look him up on IMDb, but J.T. Walsh played the asshole. Another one of those who played the asshole in just about everything he was in, from Pleasantville to um, The Negotiator. Like He was always the shady guy that had some secret and wound right. up doing this horrible thing. And the one on the other side of that is a guy named Lane Smith. Um, and I was a big, I'm, I'm more on the TV side. You've seen Lane Smith in, in Son-in-Law. He plays the father in Son-in-Law. He's my oh, cousin right, Vinny. Right, 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 right. Um, I know who you're talking about. Very Southern actor. Ridiculously good delivery. And that's one of the things I definitely look for in a character actor is someone that can turn a line just brilliantly. Yeah, that's funny. I don't have a whole lot of TV actors on here, but there is one that, that sticks out just because he's on TV right now. And that's Scott Wilson. Of course I had to add Scott Wilson in because that's my father's name. <laughs> that's my middle and last name. But no, Scott Wilson is... Uh, what is Scott Wilson? I'm blanking on this right okay, now. Okay, on Walking Dead, he's Hank. Or not, he's the father, the old guy. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, He's in, you know, he's w- Way of the Gun, mm-hmm. He's uh, where he's the mob boss. Uh, he, I mean, but he's been in tons of stuff. He, uh, <laughs> he's a great actor, but he's also one of those guys that all... Uh, it's funny because... I kind of you kind of understand him as an actor or as a performer after you see one role that he does. But he, like I said, in one he's playing like this good father veterinarian, and one he's playing a scientist, and one he's playing this, you know, uh, uh, a mob boss or whatever, and one he's playing this complete buffoon or the brother of somebody. And, and even though, essentially, he's he sells everything really well. Uh, yeah, and he's an older actor, of course, but that, I had to throw that in there. Well, and I, and I just and we'll try to go through the the TV stuff because I I kind of have one like all star character actor cast because I believe the show is populated by nothing but character actors. Um, but to stick with Walking Dead for just a second, Norman Reedus is about as perfect as you get as far as a character actor that he's completely strange and different and and odd in every role from Boondock Saints to Walking Dead. Um, but the show that I think right now holds the, the the gold standard of character actors is Justified. Um, if you're out there and you're not watching Justified, including the person I'm looking at right now, Ben, who has not started watching it. I've watched the first two episodes. Yeah, ju- I like it. Ju- but- Justified. Walton Goggins plays like the main kind of villain in the show or the, the foil for the, the lead. Um, and Walton Goggins is... And also Walton Goggins has shown up in every movie I've seen in the last two years. And he, I mean that. He's almost in every movie. He's in Lincoln. He plays like the pivotal role in Lincoln. Um, he was in... There was something else right before that that he was in. He's in Cowboys and Aliens. He's in Predators. He's in... Like, the guy just shows up in a thousand things. And he's he's another one of those guys with great delivery. But I also love that Justified is its main star as a character actor. And that's Timothy Oliphant. Right. Um... Every, like, if you watch an episode okay, of Justified... Here's the funny thing. Uh, Timothy Oliphant is is a character actor, or has been a character actor for a lot of his career. Yeah. I feel like... he. I believe that he has the ability, like, the same sort of thing that some... Well, let me put it this way. I think he would be considered as a character actor who has now become more like a leading man. A little bit, yeah. Uh, he Ray, Raylan's not quite a leading man. It's it's tough. No, it's like uh, looking uh, at somebody uh, like Kevin Bacon is another one that's very Kevin, tough. Kevin Bacon is, is a leading man. I, yeah. I, I don't consider Kevin Bacon a character. And I love Kevin Bacon. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Who doesn't love Bacon? Even right. your wife loves Bacon. Again. Hey, so do you have... How, <laughs> so... And I think that Justified actually is a great. Uh, is watch a great watch the show because you've got Nick Cersei, you've got. Um, the, the, I remember sending Ben a text one night when I was watching an episode of Justified, 
that it was like every single speaking role, if someone had more than four lines on the show, they were a famous character actor. Stephen Tobolowsky, um, or Tablowski, or however you pronounce it, right. that played Ned, uh, 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 Ned Ryerson in Groundhog Day, and he's in Memento. Um, like, it was literally just everybody in the episode just kept popping up, like, it's another, like, they, and they had them in there. Some of them only had, like, three or four lines. It was just amazing. Um, most of the actors in Game of Thrones are character I put too. that on here. Game of yeah. Thrones, um, lost a little less on Lost. I would but, say a little less. I mean... But it was such a huge well, cast. obviously you, you just got one, one major one in Lost, which is... Well, I had two. I had Michael Emerson and I had, uh, uh Terry O'Quinn. Terry O'Quinn is, yeah. I think... Uh, Terry O'Quinn was on my list. And that, honestly, you know, like, you said Philip Seymour Hoffman was like your... I was like, Terry O'Quinn to me is sort of like pops up as like, that's character <laughs> He's pretty <actor>. amazing. <laughs> uh, um, uh, actor to me. But anyways, uh, one thing I wanted to do really quick is kind of go through some of the women that you had listed down. Do you have any uh, women that specifically stood out to you? Because I have a couple really good I have ones. some arguable ones. Um, my The first one that popped into my head, the first one that made the list is Judy Greer, um, who is... Yeah. She's in a thousand things. She usually plays the friend. She's been on a lot of TV. Um, the first thing I think I saw her in actually was uh, not a great movie, but not a terrible movie called What Women Want. Um, but she like she has a really interesting way of delivering a line and of getting into a character. And she can play a lot of different things. She can play kind of creepy. She can play kind of cute. Um, she was the first one on there. And I think my favorite one working right now is Anna Kendrick. Um, who it, yeah. Anna Kendrick hasn't, I don't think she's going to be, I don't think she's going to hit lead status. Like I used to think that, that Emma Stone was more on the character side, but I think she's progress. Like, I don't think Emma Stone can go I back to that, being I, I hate to say this. And I don't mean this in any sort of, you know, way to, to demean their this because it's not a bad thing, but I feel like they're too young almost to be considered character actors. Mm. Um, I mean, the same thing is, that, like, but... I'm sure if you had looked at DiCaprio when he was 19, you would have said, oh, DiCaprio's a character actor. Right now, I don't think, I think DiCaprio's way on the other side of that now. I yes, mean, yes. Uh, I, I, I think that when you have a role or two that may be a little off kilter, maybe something a little bit more meaty that they claw into, once they start getting into the more the mainstream stuff and getting a little bit more exposure, I don't see the, any range, necessarily. Okay, I'll give you an older one. Sandra O. Oh. Sandra O's oh a good one. Um... Once again, I don't think Sandra O's oh a great actress, though. Okay. I, I think I think she classifies as what you were considering. So why don't you just tell me your list, Ben? Thanks a lot for just blowing mine out of the water. Yeah, I love those choices you made, Matt. You suck. I just have a couple. <laughs> I, I have a few that I'd like to go through. Um, Frances McDormand. Yes, definitely. Uh, I think is is probably one of the. I mean, and she is just she is very chameleon like. She changes her you know, the way that she talks. She changes the way that she. Uh, yeah, I'll definitely give you Francis. Um, Mary McDonald. Uh, Mary McDonald. Mm. Uh, she, she's. Uh, I mean, she, come on. Her first major, like, really big role was in Dance with Wolves. She played an Indian. Yeah, American. Yeah. I'm sorry, a Native American. <laughs> How you race? <laughs> that was very magic. <laughs> that that, you that racist com- son that, of a bitch. That comment was off the reservation. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, no, she she played a Native American, and since then has kind of done this really wide range of, of completely different roles. I, I, she, I, I seem, I think a lot of times she has the same delivery. She has this kind of strange. Yeah, I mean, I watch, listen, I watched Battlestar, which was like six seasons of watching her throughout a show. Well, one reason, one person that I think almost made my list, but I didn't want to put it on. She plays a lot of roles, but I feel like she's very a lot. At the times feels the same through a lot of roles is Catherine Keener. Um, I would definitely give you Catherine Keener. See, I, I love well, Catherine that's the thing. Keener. I left her off because I feel like McDonald has more range than mm-hmm. Keener does, and, and and that's just my opinion. But then of course I've got the Queen Bee. There's the Queen Bee of character actors who is a leading lady, and I, there are only a few that I've left on here yeah. that I, I consider character actors, 100 percent character actors through their career that are bona fide leading, you know, yeah. men or women. Okay, I have an idea, but let's see. Streep. Yeah, of course. Streep is a character actress. Mm-hmm. I, and, and especially, I mean, any movie that you turn on, especially if you're talking about late 70s, 80s, going into the 90s, Streep is invisible, I yeah. feel like. She completely inhabits her roles and is completely 
I mean, she disappears into him. What do you think about Angelica Houston? Uh, well, here's the thing. I would consider Angelica Houston sort of along the lines of what I was saying with Hoffman or uh-huh. De Niro or, or even Jack Nicholson, where they were very character actor based early in their careers and then kind of hit this level where they became, they were doing themselves. They were acting, not saying they were acting poorly. Yeah. You know, they were doing their characters well, but essentially they were doing it as themselves doing it. And that's just sort of the way that I thought about it. I did um, just think of one, and it's also it's one that Ben and I when when Ben and I worked on our TV series, we one of the first things we did was kind of cast it to get a, a sense of the voices, and there are a lot of meaty character roles in it and some minor ones. But one of the ones we put on there because we're both a big fan, and I love her and everything she's in is Bonnie Hunt, Bonnie um, Hunt who's great. a great she's comedic and and serious like. She's she's definitely that that textbook definition of floating between like look at her role in the Green Mile, um, like she can play very comedic. She can get on a sitcom. She can be she can always play that fun friend role. And then she gets in something like the Green Mile, which is great because she's doing essentially what Hanks does right. in a movie, which yeah. is playing a little bit funny, a little bit serious, some really good you know character moments and giving you some heart and really making you feel for the character and I definitely dig the hell out yeah, of yeah. it I, I think Bonnie Hunt's a, a good one and I, I, anyways I was just going to start with that one because Streep I think, feel like it's sort of the golden standard and just to get this out of the way too I think you've got your golden standard as a guy character actor Lewis Daniel Day Lewis who I think is the character I mean he is hmm. he is the method char- he, he always never plays. a sidekick Never a sidekick, exactly. Always the lead. He he's very. Do you consider? That's what I'm, I'm saying. It's that's a very interesting. It's a, very, it's a very hard thing because Streep Streep doesn't always play the lead. No, no, no. no. And, and especially early in her career, Streep didn't play the lead. And even now, now I a lot of times she's the she's another character. She's a character. I I don't know if I see here's the, Daniel Day Lewis. He never even popped into my head. Well, the, the thing is, is I know that he is the the funny thing is, is he's the not the main character necessarily in Gangs of New York. He's not. The main character necessarily. I mean, well, the funny thing is, is that then you look at a movie like There Will Be Blood. He is the main character. However, the the story he's driving the story forward. However, the the more three dimensional characters almost all exist around him. It's kind of which is funny. And I and his co star in There Will Be Blood, I put on my list for character actors. Paul, Paul Dano is on my list. Yeah. He's right there. Yeah, and, and and it's. But anyways, for some reason, I consider Day Lewis in the same way I consider Gary Oldman a character actor. Is on because, my list as well. Well, Gary <laughs> Oldman's on the side, and and those are both fantastic actors. I mean, those are tit for tat some of the greatest actors who have ever Absolutely. lived. Absolutely, and. I feel like both of them could qualify if we were going, in my definition of where it is, these completely different sort of chameleon type of roles. Although Oldman obviously did a lot, has done a lot more supporting work than Daniel Day-Lewis has. Yeah, Oldman almost never carries as the lead focus. I, remember, I think Tinker Taylor <clears throat> is one of the few times I've seen him actually and sort he's... of been the... Yeah, but I mean, he's still sort of like uh, he's the looming glue. character. He, he's, he's the glue in that yes, movie. Yes, yes. He's the through line, but he doesn't... I mean, that movie basically has six main characters. Well, I have one um, on my list of someone that was really poised to... They could have easily gone leading man route, and they never... I, and I don't know if it was by choice or what it was, but uh, Jude Law... Jude Law, I think, um, really was after, you know, like, Talented Mr. Ripley. Um, like, AI. AI. Like, well, yeah, and AI was still, like, he had that one that one amazing back-to-back year, which is Road to Perdition and AI, um, playing, po- like, you cannot even recognize him in Road to Perdition. You're probably a lot of you out there that will have to go back and watch the movie to be like, Jude Law was in them. Like, yeah, he plays this hunched-over, creepy strange guy but he was definitely someone that like was kind of that sex symbol he did Cold Mountain uh, which is an I think bad an movie. awful very, movie very bad movie um, great cast bad movie great cast yeah, ex- exactly um, but yeah I th- Jude Law was one of those that like I think and I'm wondering if it's by choice because he never you know he definitely could have gone I think leading man he just never he just continues to do supporting work for lack of a better word yeah, I would consider Jude Law actually a really interesting sort of choice for that. Um, I actually have a couple here that I want to go through and, and mention. This is a little disjointed, but that are sort of what exactly you talk about as far as character actors, but are more of the modern iterations of it. Um, there's one guy I want to get to in a minute who I feel like is the most underrated 
character actor uh, out there. But the the two that I was going to mention who are just weird actors <laughs> are Brad Dourif. Oh yeah, and Peter Stormare. Absolutely, you know, bo- both a plus of, on both. Both of them are very, and they've done a lot of. They've w- worked in TV. They've worked in film. They're always in these, uh, not even supporting roles. They're usually these one-off. They're a walk-on. Bits. Yeah, they're walk-on bits for certain scenes. Where, where, or, or certain segments or, or things yeah. along those lines. <laughs> they almost always have their own contained storyline. Exactly. <laughs> it, it, it's weird. And, and I almost feel like they're, they're actors that are so good and so they're so singularly interesting that I feel like a lot of times guys will make a movie and they're going to be like, ah, this movie's min- missing something. We have to get Peter Stormare in here. Just write a scene for him and have this right in the Michael story. Bay definitely does that with him. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one good thing Michael Bay does is he knows he's like, well, we need to fill 10 minutes here between explosions and, and ass shots. Let's get Peter Stormare to play a strange, crazy dude and pull him in. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, <laughs> I mean, you, you have that. Or in Brad Dorif, it's the same sort of thing. It was like, I still remember when I, I was reading all of the making of stuff in season one of the X-Files. Um, at one point I went through and I watched the, the X-Files from season one to season six where I stopped. Because it, got, it gets bad after that. And plus, I remember watching a lot of the stuff after season, season six when it was originally airing. But in season one, they like used like a fourth of their budget for the first 12 shows on one episode, which was episode 10, because they bought Brad Dorif for yeah. that show. <laughs> and they were like, he is way outside of our pay grade for this for, type of yeah. show. For I mean, this show was just picked up by Fox and had a relatively low budget at that time. was not a hit in its first season. And the showrunners and uh, Chris Carpenter got them to make it <laughs> because uh, Brad Dorf was like, it, it, it still, to me, it holds up as one of the top three episodes of the entire show. Pretty good show. Because it's, episode. yeah, episode, which is Beyond the Sea. It's episode 10 in season one. But it's worth it because I feel like they were like, ugh, we don't have a hit on our hands yet. The show's losing a little steam. We have this great script. Let's write it. Let's get Brad Dourif in here. We have to get him. And they wrote the role for Dourif. Well, the and, I, and I love, like, and that's that's what I love about a really good showrunner and, and someone that's focused on the right things. They didn't, like, go for a star. They yeah. went for a star character actor. Like, Brad Dourif is not a household name. Oh, Even no, back no. then, yeah. was not a household name. No, 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 They're no, just no. like, we want this guy and it's a, on the next level from what we normally cast in this, but we think it's going to breathe something amazing into this episode. I feel like at that point and even now, Brad Dourif is most well known for being the voice of Chucky. Oh yeah, I would say definitely. I, 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 Maybe I, Deadwood now, but uh, well, yeah, I mean, less, I, yeah. I, he's done a lot of stuff later in his career, and his Worm Tongue, yeah, yeah, and Lord of the Rings. But I think, yeah, I think through the '90s, especially, it was like, oh yeah, that guy who does the voice of Chucky, and that's pretty much it. Well, I think that's kind of interesting with also the the evolution of TV, and we'll get into this in a, definitely in another podcast. And sorry, we keep telling you like we give you these little teasers and then we say we're doing another podcast trust us we will actually get to to all these things but like the casting in tv the difference between the 2000s and the 1990s is so so diametrically opposed because the 90s there was still no confidence in tv and then in the 2000s you started seeing these major actors showing up like Kiefer sutherland showing up 24 which he might have been the first I, I'm curious about that when we talk about it. But well, here's the funny thing about Kiefer Sutherland: when he showed up in 24, I felt like it was a natural progression for his career because Kiefer Sutherland went from being essentially a character actor, funny yeah. enough, uh, but the son of a famous actor, to a brief leading man in the 90s. You know, with yeah. uh, with The Vanishing and with uh, Flatliners and with all of these other movies that he was he was the main actor in. Then picked up some weird sort of more character roles again with like Dark City and whatnot. Yeah. And I know that he had apparently he was, I think he went to rehab at one point. Oh, yeah. he's, and he's he's no. Well, it was a, it was kind of like everyone was like, wow, why is like it, I remember everyone talking to me like, so Kiefer Sutherland is slumming in this Fox series. But I, I don't remember thinking about it that way. I mean, maybe that was just me because I remember thinking. He oh, well, Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland hasn't done... He's done a lot of movies, but he hasn't done anything in the real life But you're going to think of it, TV used to be a launching ground. It was not a place that people right, right. you knew... You knew Came people from it. other TV shows, but you never saw someone that was a film actor known for that. Anyway, we'll, we'll get into that more. Right, um, right, right. I do want to kind of focus on... Um, and some of these are going to cross over, but we haven't really talked a ton about comedic 
character actors. And that's kind of what my introduction to a lot of character actors. And I love a really good, like one of my gold standards for comedic character actors who also can dial it in when he's used is J.K. Simmons, who sure. I think every time J.K. Simmons shows up in something, he brings his A game. Like sure. he's never sleepwalking through it. And that's why he's been in everything from Law and Order to Spider Man to Juno. Like he's all over the place. He just right. shows up and stuff. I feel like John C. Riley's a good one too. Absolutely. Even though he he has the ability to cross I mean John C. Riley has the crossover ability between drama and comedy like it's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's uh I mean cuz he he's great in a lot of dramatic roles you know in the 80s and 90s and then all of a sudden, you know, once the 2000 rolls around, all of a sudden he's like the go-to guy to be funny against Will Ferrell, you know? Yeah, and that's and it's awesome when you see those guys that I I always love that in the casting of of a movie when the director is really smart at picking some like I like when they fill a comedic supporting role with a really good actor and sure. you just see that come in. Um another one of mine that's kind of on that like MVP list is Danny DeVito. Um sure. DeVito, I mean, started in TV with one of the most iconic TV roles of all time with Louis De Palma and Taxi. Um and then just Never, listen, no one looks at Danny DeVito and is like, yes, that's our leading man. Like, he's not going to show up as ever as the, like, dashing romantic lead. And But he always brings his A-game on uh, on his supporting work. Um, and another one I have in here that was in a movie we talked about just uh, a moment ago is Brendan Gleeson. Um, I actually have Brendan Gleeson right next to uh, Timothy Spall. Both of nice. Them, very two, good two very good... Uh, British actors. Who... You can you can basically make this list, by the way, just with Harry Potter movies. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I mean, don't think there's anyone in a supporting role in Harry Potter that is not a ridiculously good character yeah, actor. Yeah, I mean, like Maggie Smith is a pretty good female character actor. That's absolutely somebody who we didn't mention, but uh, but yeah, I, I had actually Timothy Spall sort of right up against Brendan Gleeson too. Uh, who, are, who are both British, uh, very, those are both very well-known stage actors and move from the stage to these sort of supporting roles, both which play uh, very convincing, like, bosses or, like, mobsters or whatever. Yes. They, they, they do that well. Well, there and there's uh, there's two other good Brits um, that I want to mention in that same breath. Uh, one is Toby Jones, um, who... Oh, man, that's a good one. I cannot believe I didn't think of Toby, Toby Jones. Toby Jones is just... Actually, Toby Jones is up... He would be up there with, actually, what I would consider one of the most underrated. Exactly. Like, Toby Jones, you probably... You don't know the name, but you've seen Toby Jones in a movie at, at some point. He's in The Mist. He's in... Um, he played the, the, he was in the other Capote movie, Infamous. Um, he's one of those that... He's it, in The Painted Veil, he was in, um, uh, well... Uh, the, he was the voice of Dobby in Harry Potter. Yeah, he was the voice of Dobby, <laughs> wasn't he? Um, and he did the motion capture for Dobby, probably. He Because he's about the size of Dobby. <laughs> they just carried him around. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Walter, sir, it's Toby Jones. <laughs> Shut up, Dobby. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even have to put any makeup on him. <laughs> It was, it was a motion capture. It was a motion capture. Just Toby was... Jones without makeup. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Toby Jones. We're so sorry. Was, uh, we, we, we love, we we love you, Toby to, Jones. We love Toby Jones. <laughs> um, and I, I had another one in my head for a second, but um, curious, uh, keeping on the Potter side, Rickman. Um, I, I think he could be considered that. I, th- I didn't put him. Oh, I didn't put him either. Yeah, I, I, I think Rickman is Rickman more than anything else. And I, I think agree. He's a, he's a fantastic actor, and he has a, that that great thing that you know he, he has such a, a magnetic ability about him. But I don't consider him a character actor. However, the and the funny thing is, I'll, I I wrote it down just the last name because I consider both equally uh, character actors, even though they have done leading roles or both of the Fines brothers. I think Joseph and Ray Fines are both absolutely fantastic character actors. Who have done a real myriad of, of stuff, uh, and it, and you made me think of a good female one actually off of uh, Joseph Fines, which is Kate Blanchett. Yeah, Kate Blanchett is. You're right. Got to be. She's up there. She's definitely got to be on that character actor side of just. No, she's played Dylan, and she's played. Uh, <laughs> I mean, she, she's played everything. She's played everything. Yeah, I don't think she. I don't think there's any way for her not to. No, you're right to do it. And it's funny she didn't come to mind when I was going through. Me my, neither. My but it's, that's why I kind of like we we like these discussions. This is how we talk when we get into this stuff. Is like we, shit. How yeah, do we, how not, do we forget? How do we person? forget that one? How do we not think about that? I'm gonna make take a stab, and I'm gonna guess one of your most underrated. Well, I've got one as is. 
most underrated because he's working a lot now. I know exactly who it is. Who? Michael Shannon. Nope. Fuck. You know what's funny? <laughs> no. Not put Michael Shannon on your I, list? I didn't put Michael Shannon on my list, but the funny... I, I love Michael Shannon. Um, the funny thing is, is when I was like... I was thinking... I, I asked my wife, I was like, uh, you know, I'm trying to think... Just come up with a really long list of good character actors. She was like, do you put Michael Shannon on there? And the reason why she asked that is because I... Men, we watched Take Shelter yeah. last week uh, for the first time, and uh, she was like, I was like, um, yeah, Michael Shannon's, you know, really well known for being like one of these, you know, uh, like he's considered one of the better actors out there right now. And she was like, who the fuck is he? Like, <laughs> I don't know who this guy is. It's all over the He's <laughs> on. And I was like, well, he was in, and I'm like coming through, I'm like, well, he was not, he's an Academy Award nominee. He was nominated for uh, Revolutionary Re- Road. Revolutionary Road. He's been around since the '90s. She's like, "Well, what else has he been in?" I was like, I, uh, it, "That is, and that, by the way, is a great sign of a good character actor. That it's really hard." Like, I was thinking for Toby Jones. I'm like, "Yeah, Toby Jones. He's been in, he's Saw been him. in like a forty-seven different things, but I can't remember." Yeah, exactly. I, Shannon, <laughs> did you know that Michael Shannon is in Groundhog Day? Yeah, he's he has one line. He plays. <laughs> he, he plays a really happy, like and young he, guy. And he plays. <laughs> you know he, who he plays? Jerry. That's, that's <laughs> his, his, Jerry. Michael Shannon. I'm Jerry. <laughs> I'm Jerry. <laughs> You might remember me as Jerry and from my, Groundhog Day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, here is my... Wow, that's not on there. My, my um, No, I, I like Michael Shannon. I know your too. wife's favorite character actor. Who? Michael Pitt. Oh, that's a good one. I didn't think about that. Yeah, oh, Michael your voice Pitt. got so like deep there. Like, oh yeah, my wife is so going to love it when uh, I bring up Michael I, Pitt's I, I was, name I was, later. <laughs> I was putting on my Michael Pitt voice. Actually, that's not what Michael Pitt sounds not like Not even at all. close. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I like Michael Pitt a lot too. Yeah, he's a good one. No, here is the one that I listed as my most underrated. And I'm like oh. kind of going, yeah. and you're going to uh, think it's ridiculous, I think maybe, is uh, John Hawks. He's on my list. Yes. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. We have crossover. I love John Hawks. And especially, here's the thing. John Hawks is a is one of the, tr- he crosses over both uh, bounds. He's a chameleon actor, but he's also had a bit in his career where he was that character side guy, like yes. in, uh, in The Perfect Storm, where mm-hmm. he's uh, the goofy whatever. And he, he played that role in a lot of movies in the late, no- late 90s and early 2000s. Because he has that look, you know, he's very weaselly. Yes, um, and he, he looks like a character that Sean Penn is playing. Uh, <laughs> like he always like I don't think there actually is a John Hawk. I think it's just Sean, Sean Penn, Penn like playing the role of his life. <laughs> that's, that's pretty funny. Um, but you no, know, John Hawks is I think is the most underrated character actor out there, just because it's funny because he's. I feel like in Hollywood films, he's always this sort of side character and does great work. Always, it seems like. And then I see these independent films with them, like Me and You and Everyone We Know, and especially... Uh, the Sessions. M- m- uh, well, I haven't seen The Sessions yet. I really do want to see it. But uh, Martha... Mar- oh, Martha, Martha May, Marcy Marley, yeah, May- Mar- 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 whatever it is. Mar- that, Mar- his performance in that movie, he's is frightening. Amazing. He is scary. Like, he is absolutely terrifying in that movie. And I was like, I how the... Fuck, am I terrified by John Hawks? <laughs> like, the weaseliest, like, most ridiculous, like, goofiest looking guy who I'm like, who's like, hey, I, I'm John Hawks or whatever. He is scary in that movie. Yeah, and those I was people like, that can wow. scare you. The, the same as, like, the, the two sides of it. The ones that can make you laugh and feel that hard are great. And then the ones that just unnerve you that you were like, but that was my friend. Like, we, right. we, we, were, we were good in this movie. No, no. Anyways, that, that would be my, uh, that was sort of the one I wanted to kind of arrive at at the end of the list is because I feel like he is Critically underrated. There, are, and yeah, and, and most of the rest of my list is kind of a, a lot of people you've heard of. I have Jeffrey Tambor, who's a great sure. TV and and film actor. Um, Steve Buscemi, who's kind of like the grandfather now, I think, of character actors. Yeah, and he, he's he, getting up there. He's he's definitely not been Peter around. Falk. Not oh Peter Falk. Peter great Falk was character a actor. I stayed. It's funny. I didn't do a lot of the older actors. I mean, you could do that. Ed Asner, you know, a quintessential character actor. Gene Hackman, though. Gene Hackman is fantastic a character actor. Um, for the middle aged ones, I have Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton, I think, is <laughs> is definitely a character actor. I almost consider him a character. Yeah, like, in the same <laughs> way. Bit. In the same way that Harrison Ford is just. A I, character. I, I I could see that. I, um, I, I think that I love the Paxton, but I have one that I I surprised I didn't hear from you, which is Hugo Weaving. Since you're such a Lord of the Rings guy, yeah. but no, you go weaving. No t- character actor to who you go weaving. Are I, you nuts? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm thinking of why I left him off my list. 
Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I feel like he's. I mean, he's an excellent actor. Uh, I'm, I'm and I'm trying to think of somebody I can equate Hugo Weaving to, where the same sort of people who are like they are good actors and they sort of disappear into these roles, but for some reason, kind of in the same way Philip Seymour Hoffman seems like less of a character actor, yeah. Where they're like these fantastic actors, but there's something that they hold on very to identifiable that, 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 that makes me identify with them yeah, or Tom Cruise I'm, I'm not sure why but maybe that's the way I feel about weaving I, I just had one son of a son of a bitch um, let me let me see if I can I like it just popped into my head I thought oh um, this is one I didn't hear you mention but this uh, this is definitely for me character actor especially because they showed up there are a lot of character actors that just like got tapped over and over and over again through the 90s and 2000s one of those I think is Oliver Platt Oliver Platt, there was a period yeah. of time where Oliver Platt was in, like, 15 movies a year, and would just, like, I, I imagine that his life was just flying set to set to set, and never really doing, a, I think he's another one that's kind of, like, just a character, character. Like, Oliver Platt would just show up, and they're like, what are you doing today? Like, oh, I'm Oliver Platt, but I'm wearing, like, doubloons, and and I'm doing Shakespeare. And then the other day, he's like, Oliver Platt, I'm playing a scientist. Okay, give me my lab coat, I'm Oliver Platt scientist, but... They're kind of like those those Swiss Army knives and actors. I love a plan. I love a plan. Oh yeah, one last one. I'm curious okay. your take on this, Mandy Patinkin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can see it. I can see. Yeah, it I wasn't way. sure. I, I I threw him on there again. I, most of my a lot of mine come from TV because I think it really is the the as as TNT says, characters matter here. Well, the funny thing is, is <laughs> Mandy Patinkin and like uh, in what you might call it uh, Homeland, and Mandy Patinkin in that whatever it was, the CSI or whatever it was that he was yeah. in, was very similar to mm, me. Maybe. So I, I maybe that's why I consider him more of like just kind of that. I mean, I think he's a good actor. I think he's a good performer. But uh, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily put them on the top of any sort of character actor list. All right, well, uh, we're we're getting close to the end here. We want to do a a, Q, a, a question question time. Um, so uh, last night we were out for uh, for Ben's wife's birthday, and she was talking about the podcast and about how Ben Ben's aunt, she hasn't been necessarily satisfied with Ben's answers in the podcast because she feels that Ben is painting um, himself to be a a more saintly well, here, here person. Well, here's the he thing. Oh, like, for example, there was a previous <laughs> question that was asked, what's the nicest or the meanest thing you've ever done to a nice person? And Ben's answer was like a, a ridiculously tame prank he did when he was 13 you know, that involved 11. playing loud music. No, no. <laughs> Whereas like, and and uh, my wife, of course, this is how came to my wife, is she's like, Think of all the girls that you've done horrible <laughs> you know, shit to. I love the way she said it. Because she was, it made it sound like you were a silly. She's like, but what about all those things you did to those poor girls? I was like, oh my god, what? Did, like at first it didn't like click with me. I was like, Jesus, she know like where the bodies are buried or something? Like, it sounded so ominous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, so I've done a lot of bad things, obviously. But the thing is, when it's like to a nice person, I was thinking of somebody who, in my head, just remained like 100% yeah, yeah, like yeah. untainted or I, I don't know that's where my mind I just answered the first thing that came to my mind there alright well the question I'm giving you today okay in honor of your, your wife and today is Mother's Day and, and Ben's wife is going soon to be a mother to twin girls what is the worst lie you have ever told your wife oh wow I know and listen and Ben and Beth have a very very open, honest relationship. But I know there's got to be something. The worst lie I ever told my wife. Well, and and here's the thing. I could cop out and be like the whole thing about like the birthday party or all that crap. No, 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 that's not an answer. No, exactly. This is, uh, this is not my answer, but one time my wife had a surprise birthday party, which (laughs) caused me to lie and continuously lie for like three weeks straight, which was awful. (laughs) <laughs> and, and it was this, this complete nightmare. And, but it, she was surprised, luckily, when we actually got to the final surprise. And disappointed. Point, I was, like, going straight to the bar. I was like, get me a fucking drink. I am never doing this again because it's the worst thing I've ever done in my entire life. I was just so stressful and so awful. You know, the worst lie I've ever told my wife. Oh, man. There was... You know, it's really hard because there's nothing that really sticks out to me. I'm, I'm going That's through. Okay. I'm going through a couple of like little petty white lies. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna. There was one time when we first started dating. Well, yeah, I'm, it could be something you came clean about at some point. Well, I mean, I 
there's nothing I haven't come clean about, oh, it, I yeah, don't yeah. think, in my entire relationship with my wife. That's why I'm trying to think of something that was... I'm, that, that's the one thing, because I'm thinking some of the like little petty white lie stuff, which I may not have come... Anything that was yeah. major, which I haven't... I don't lie that much. <laughs> um, do you look good in that dress? Oh. No. I, and, uh, honey, you do. I'm just saying that, that that's the type of thing. Oh, okay. I'm, that, that's the type of line of thinking I'm thinking along because there was one time where I still remember. And here's the thing: I and if my wife could correct me and could tell me specifically what it was, I felt really, really awful about this for a long time. There was one specific circumstance where I hadn't been dating her for that long, where she either asked me what was going on or what I was doing or like something, and I just told her a lie. I'm not sure why I lied. But she, like, immediately found out that it wasn't true and was, like, approached me and was like, so why do you lie? And the thing is, I can't remember. I, it was so long ago, I can't remember what it was, but I felt, like, sick about it for, like, a week. So you just stopped lying. It, like, it cured yeah. you. <laughs> it cured me of my lying. But the funny thing is, I can't, I still can't remember because I felt like it was something that was relatively asinine, like, um... I mean, who knows what it was? Like, where I ate for... Or, Does, dinner, or, uh, or who I was hanging out with, or something along those did lines. Did Beth know when you told me she was pregnant? Um. <laughs> did I just catch you? <laughs> no, I never lied. No, because I, I told you, and then I told her that I told you. Oh, okay, all yeah. right, yeah. I, I told her... <laughs> no, here's the thing. I told her I wasn't telling anybody. Then I told you, and then I told, told her, her that okay, I told you. gotcha. Well, what the reason I ask that is, and this is a testament to why Ben will not lie to his wife ever, is that Ben told me and told me that she didn't know, and I was terrified for like a couple of weeks until Ben let me know that she knew that I knew because I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna screw it up. I'm gonna like Beth has a way to stare at you that like you just start confessing. Like, you confess things you didn't even do. I was like, yeah, I had all those girls in my apartment for 10 years, and then I threw them up in Cleveland. She's like, that's not true. I'm like, no, it's not, but I, I had to confess it. I didn't. Yeah. I don't even know where that came from. Uh, oh. oh. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Apparently our time is up. <laughs> that, was the, that, that was the truth ring. Um, anyways, so, well, here will be my, my question. Um... And it's Mother's Day, so don't do something that's no, going to make no, my mother no. uncomfortable. No, 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 uh, This seems I, to be maybe the only podcast she could actually listen to and not not think I'm a horrible human being. <laughs> you haven't said anything bad, though. It's all been pretty funny stuff, hey, actually. Yeah. yeah, how many times has your mom listened to the podcast? Uh, never. Never. <laughs> exactly. Uh, like I said, I'm not sure she even knows it exists yet. But, um, I, well, here, well, here, okay, so here's sort of my, um... My question, and this is sort of a, a I, not embarrassing at all, I don't think. Um, what, well, it's kind of embarrassing. Okay. What is the, what's the longest trip you've ever taken to be with a woman? <laughs> Ben's uh, making air quotes. I'm making air quotes. Um, to be, what, what's the longest trip you've made for a girl? So, Oh, like that's the only thing I'm doing yes. for this trip. It can't be something where I was it, going it somewhere no, and no. then I. It can't be it, a influence my decision. It, it, it can't be a twofer <laughs> where it's like, oh, I've got this thing going on in Orlando. Plus, uh, gosh, um, I want to say not far. Like I've never, oh, I've never flown. I've never like bought a plane ticket just and for flown a girl. somewhere just to see a girl. But I've driven some distances. I would say. The normal Florida distances, like with Miami being the south end and Orlando being the the north end, I haven't gone outside. So you've driven like, like four hours or five hours, not uh, even round hour. trip, round trip. Yeah, like a two hour, two and that's a half. That's not hour. bad. No, no, because listen, even the two, I, I know I can't. I know that that's my limit. Like I, two hours, two and a half hours is my limit because. Right around two hours, I start being like, I don't know if this is such a good idea. Like, I start to put things in perspective and be like, I'm going a long way to make this ridiculous thing happen. <laughs> and then turn around. And, and that's the other side of it, is that if you make a lengthy trip for a girl, there is always going to be guilt on that ride back. Like, that is the lonely journey back, because you're by yourself, and everything's done. And you're just like, 
Ah, oh, jeez. Like, really, I couldn't. I couldn't find someone like thirty minutes away from me. Like, I could. Like, really, I had to go to this extent and make this happen. See, I think that's the that's uh, the longest I've uh, I've driven. Wow. Okay. You you seem to have a but you drove a lot back for like college oh, stuff sure, yeah, and yeah. So. and I had long distance girlfriends. I think the longest I've ever driven was twelve hours. Oh my god! Yeah, why? I don't know. <laughs> 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 because I was like, uh... <laughs> seemed like a twelve <laughs> hours. Twelve Jeez hours. Louise, no, that's one way. That's forever. <laughs> it is. That's, that's... <laughs> Take forever. Yeah, that's like 147 times as long as what you went there to do. (laughs) I don't know if that math is correct, but... Wait, wait, what is 12 hours divided by 30 seconds? bringing out the the trusty calculator. Here we go. So if we got 12 divided by 147... Um, that would mean... Wait, wait, sorry, that's not what I meant to do. You want 12 divided by... What are the minutes going on? Uh, okay, so... <laughs> so 60 <laughs> times 12 equals... Divided by... 127 <laughs> equals... That means each of my sexual sessions were 5.66 minutes long. Wow. I, I think you overestimate me. <laughs> That's a pretty good average right there. I, uh, by the way, I just <laughs> I just thought of a genius. And it, it, we're putting this on the podcast, so don't steal it. But I just thought of a genius song for our rock musical, which is going to be the same thing as Rent's, like five thousand twenty five hundred. Oh, yeah. It's just going to be about the minutes spent tr- driving to go get laid. And it's just going to be the probably for the the, the loop character, <laughs> nice. just like sitting there in his car, like driving, like four thousand twenty five hours for thirty seconds of love. <laughs> <I like laughs> anyway, it. all right, folks, this is going to bring our podcast to an end. Even though this is going to air uh, a few weeks later, we're both going to wish our lovely mothers a happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Even though Ben's mom doesn't listen and my mom has disowned me after listening. But uh, we love you out there. As always, you can go to our website, www. I'm going to say it every time. I don't care. It just pops out of my head. www.lastpintprod.com. Facebook slash Last Pint. Twitter slash Last Pint Prod. Uh, This has been The New Way with Ben and Matt. I am Matt. I'm Ben. And we'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.